Thank you so much. And a big thank you to Emma Dressler for um, hosting these events and everybody at the library. And right from the first time, I said, well, what if we did something like this? She was all in. And she always is very supportive of all of the ideas and all of the writers. And I've also especially been thinking of Tina a lot lately because I know Tina loved, loved, loved Stephen's last novel. She raved about it. So I said, when she put, when I saw it was her birthday on Facebook, it was right after Stephen agreed to come. So I said, Tina, I got you Stephen Height reading poetry for your birthday. <laughs> so, so this is uh, Tina's birthday present. Um, I'm going to keep my interview, or sorry, my introduction of Steve brief because as modest he's um, he's as modest as he is talented, and I know if I sit here and um, list off all of his accomplishments, he will be mortifyingly embarrassed by the end. No, so I'll just it. tell you, do you love <laughs> it? Okay, well, here we go. I'm so it's very, very easy to find me raving about Stephen's books. I've made kind of a career of it. I've raved about his novels and his nonfiction on CBC Radio, CBC Alberta. I've written about his um, mountaineering book academically. I've written reviews of his books in several places. So all of, I read everything he writes as soon as it comes out, and I always expect the very best, and I've never, ever once been disappointed. And I was a fan before I met him, and when I met him, I became a fan of him personally, too. He's one of the most ethical, upstanding people that I know, and always insightful and enjoyable to be with. And so actually, now I am embarrassing, just like I said I wouldn't. <laughs> and so I'm really, really happy that he's here. He's written in every genre, um, short fiction, long fiction, nonfiction, poetry, and now he just released an album. And tomorrow night at the distillery, him and uh, Ginger are going to play. So if you have don't have plans tomorrow at 7 o'clock by donation, they're going to be playing at the distillery, and it's going to be amazing. Um, and his last time in Fernie was 2010 for the Fernie's Writers Conference organized by Keith. So it's been 11 years since you've been here, and welcome back. Thank you. Thanks, thanks very much, Angie. Is that audible? Is that good? Yeah. And um, I want to thank you. I've never done this, but I do publicly for your support of my writing over the years and your friendship. It's really meant a lot to me, more than I can say. So thank you. <coughs> and, um, yeah, anyway. And we're going to talk about mostly about this book, but then also he has a new poetry collection out, and we might also bring in his novel that um, weaves in with this book, with this book, Reaching Myth Mythimna, uh, Among the Volunteers and Refugees on Lesbos, is about Stephen deciding, uh, what did you say? You decided um, all but overnight decision. Yeah. You decided that you were going to go to Greece and go on the shores and help the refugees arriving from Syria. Yeah. So that's a remarkable, and I want to come back to that. Before I do, I want to say you're still, even when you're talking about this huge adventure and like traumatic situation and it must have been a world changing experience, you're still obsessed with etymology. So we're going to talk about your love of language, but first I want to talk about the word refugee and the etymology of that and why it interests you. Explain to us where the word refugee comes from. Is it in Greek that you were talking well, about? Well, I, I think. Uh, the, well, I'm talking about uh, the actual Greek word at the beginning and how interesting it is. It's uh, prosphigas. Prosphigas, uh, pros means towards. So, uh, and figus is like cognate with uh, fugue and the fugi part of refugee. So, prosphigas literally means to flee, but to flee towards. So it's not fleeing from something, but fleeing towards something. And that's kind of interesting because when you think of a refugee, you think, I think first, maybe you don't, but I think first of someone who's fleeing from something, from war maybe persecution of some kind. Uh, but the Greek etymology is interesting because it means fleeing towards, trying to find a home. And um, yeah, uh, and that's where the word comes and from. And so it's a kind of in-between state. Well, it is an in-between state. Yeah, they're flying, I, fleeing from something towards something, but they But in the meantime, you, have, you no longer have a home behind you, and you, you still don't have a home in front of you. So you're in a, this uh, liminal state between uh, homes, one that no longer exists, and one that may never exist. So it's a very, it's a poignant state. And at one point where one of the refugees has quite good English, you work up the nerve to ask him what that voyage was like, what it was like being out in the water and the... I, I thought I would be able to do that more often. I thought that uh, a lot of the refugees would speak some English, um, and I quickly found out that almost none of them did. Uh, whenever I met someone who did, I felt I had to, uh, if I felt the person looked like they would be willing and able to tell their story, I felt I had to ask um, what it had been like, and um, yeah, the, the stories were harrowing. <clears throat> I want to come back to that, but I want to talk about your decision to go, because you talk about the book, there's some practical reasons, you decided very quickly, and part of it was you were between revisions on your book, your child had grown up, so you didn't have to be there for her. You were at a stage of your marriage that you needed a, a break. It was an okay thing. And you're, you have Greek heritage, so you wanted to go. 
those are very practical reasons, but I think there are other reasons. How much, did, what are some of the other less like it works right now reasons? What are some of the deeper reasons? And does your, did, was it anything to do with the age you were? Like, is it something you would have done younger? How old were you? Uh, okay, so it was 2015, so I was 54. Um, it, I was working on a novel that concerned uh, fictional refugees um, you know, on Cyprus, um, so not in Greece. But uh, I, so I've been thinking a lot about refugee issues, and um, I was between drafts of that novel. It's called The Nightingale Won't Let You Sleep. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about these fictional refugees, but in light of what was happening in Greece, at that point, with the you know the massive exodus of refugees, mainly from Syria, but also from, from Afghanistan, who were trying to get into Europe, mainly to Germany, uh, in light of what was actually happening, my sort of fictional, speculative novel seemed kind of um, frivolous, uh, even in some ways irrelevant. You know, it's just a small thing compared to this real human crisis. Uh, that made me feel like I should do something concrete for a change. You know, as, as a fiction writer. Um, you're constantly creating these little illusory worlds and if you're very lucky maybe a few thousand people will actually uh, engage with the, this world you've created. And it's a fairly small number of people. I mean that's still something and I'm grateful for it. But at any rate, it's a small thing. Um, <clears throat> and I just felt I wanted to do something really concrete. There's something a little abstract about these invented worlds. This was a very concrete situation. But I want to, the one thing I've been trying to emphasize lately is that <clears throat> this wasn't um, me just doing, you know, helping refugees the way I always help refugees. I'd never done it before. And if this had been a refugee crisis happening in Eritrea, for example, I wouldn't have gone. Uh, so there was a, an element of selfishness. I mean, my mother was Greek. She died in 2001. I've been thinking a lot about her as I worked on the novel about Greek refugees. Um, so my mother was in my mind, Greece was in my mind. Uh, I thought maybe I could be a little helpful because I can speak a little bit of Greek. Um, that didn't help at all, actually. So there were, there were reasons that are, are not exactly altruistic. Uh, what I mean is I wouldn't necessarily have gone if it had been somewhere I didn't want to go at that time, and I wanted to be in Greece. So there was a selfish dimension, and that's really important to say. You had a kind of, a, and I think you put that in the book through reactions of others. So you have a couple sort of hostile encounters, and I'm thinking of one in particular at a restaurant where the guy didn't sit down and he was standing talking to you, and you felt kind of interrogated. And he is saying he's starting to ask your reasons to come, and he says strangers never come to help strangers for no for no reason. You must have other reasons. And, and you know, he he was a right winger. He was a Greek soldier. He was the son of um, the woman who owned the guest house that I was staying in, and he's. He, he just didn't like the volunteers there. He was very skeptical of their motives. He said, you know, he said they're all coming here to have sex or they're coming here for a holiday in the sunshine. Um, and, and I said, well, I actually, you know, my mother was Greek. I thought I could be helpful. And I actually would, I think all the volunteers that I've met really do seem to want to help if they can. And he said, no, it's always more complicated. People always have their, but he's right. He was absolutely right. There are always other reasons. There are always other things that tip you into making this decision. You know, I, all the volunteers I met there were decent people who wanted to do something, but they all had their own reasons for being there. Not necessarily bad reasons, but some something pushed them towards doing that in that place. Once you decided, okay, I'm going to do this, like overnight you decided I need to be a man of action, I'm tired of sitting at my desk, I want to do something to really help. Yeah. Did it all fall into place? Like, did it feel like it was meant to happen, or was it yeah, smart to it, there? Yeah, it was amazing. I, you know, I'm the kind of person who constantly comes up with these, you know, great ideas, or ideas that seem great, and then I don't act on them. <clears throat> what surprised me, and especially if there's any kind of logistical impediment, if I'm going to have to go online and find a ticket, a plane, uh, and deal with Air Canada, uh, I'm almost sure to say, oh, no, I think I'll just pour myself another scotch and watch a movie or something. In this case, it all turned out to be very easy, and partly it was easy because of the refugee crisis itself. It had destroyed tourism in Greece. Um, and also this was November, so tourism was never, was not a big thing. It was very easy to find flights, they were very cheap, and I'm really a frugal person, that's how I've survived as a writer. I don't like spending money if I can avoid it. And um, so I was worried, you know, I went online, how are they, if the price had been too much, that might have been just enough to keep me from doing it. You know how it is, sometimes uh, making decisions or not making them is a matter of just one little straw, you know. Um, 
but the, the prices were cheap. It was really easy, and, and there was a flight within a few days. Uh, it was, yeah, so everything seemed to align um, right away. Did you intend, when you went, to write a book about it? Did you know the whole time you'd probably write a book about it? No, I really didn't, because I was in the middle of a novel, and I knew there were, uh, at the time, I thought maybe another year of work, and that's always wrong when you think there's another year of work on a novel. That, that means there's two more years of work, or three. Um, but I knew that I had lots more work to do on this novel. I thought maybe the things I saw there would, would find their way into my novel and make it more you know, plausible and concrete. Uh, I, I knew, as, because I was a writer, and I knew I'd be seeing something that was important, I felt for sure I would write an article or articles you know, for the, the Globe or the Walrus or whatever. Um, but I didn't think I'd be writing a novel, certainly not a memoir. I've never felt any urge to write in that form. Um, but yeah, and in fact, I didn't try to write a book for uh, at least two years. Two years after I was there, I finished the novel. I finally went back to the notes, about 60 pages of notes I took while I was there, and then thought, okay, there is something here. I'm going to try to write um, an account of that month. And we're, when you're trying to explain to the hostile guy why you're there, it comes up that you're a writer, and he says, oh, so you're a reporter. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of... Um, derogatory and, it, and I when, when you talk about people having different reasons like they're going there to help but they also want to have sex and have fun and see Greece and be on a holiday but feel good about it I think there's a equivalent a writer is equivalent to that where you're going there to help but you're also and I say this with absolute respect for no, you no. and knowing that you have the highest ethics in the world but you're also a bit of a parasite <laughs> that's the wrong word but you know what I mean you're like going and these people are in pain you're like maybe I can get a story to this maybe I can get something Maybe like it's been the global mail, and I, I, knowing you, I know that would cause you discomfort. I assume. Did that cause you discomfort? Well, no, no, it didn't. No. I, I mean, I know what you're saying, but I, what I would have been thinking is, um, some of the you know, people need to bear witness what's happening. I, I mean, in Canada, very few people were paying much attention to this situation. In Europe, uh, this story was was huge. It was front page story day after day. <clears throat> in Canada, uh, not at all. Uh, it was a long way away. I mean, th there were stories, and you know, remember when that um, the Kurdish boy, uh, Alan Kurdi, was that was his name, when he drowned, and there was that photo. I mean, it just shows the power of one image. That one image got people interested, and for a little while, the story was at the top of the news cycle. But you know how the news cycle works. If you're not Donald Trump, people move on very quickly, and people did. <clears throat> so I thought it would be important. Um, Partly to have a Canadian perspective on it, a North American perspective, let's say, because we weren't paying much attention. So if I go over there as a volunteer and I bear witness to what I see, that could be valuable to get people more interested in what's happening and pay more attention, sending more money to aid organizations who will waste most of it being officious. And oh, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Sorry. <laughs> And, and um, in a way, that kind of helped, like turning uh, the world's eye on it, turning Canada's eye on it, could be more helpful than you standing there on the beach and pulling the number of people you pull up. It can be, it could reach more people. You're right. Absolutely, yeah. Um, now, that's interesting because I was, it was very much at the front of my mind, the Syrian crisis, but maybe that's because I'm Syrian and yeah, because you, yeah. I knew you were there. So I knew you were there and I was watching it and I was, you know, I'm Syrian, so. And you were, were you working on the book then with the Syrian character? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so of course, so I, yeah, it makes, it makes sense, but. Yeah. <clears throat> and this isn't a criticism of, of Canada. I mean, to, to a great extent, we're, we're quite insulated here from, if you're comfortably middle class, Canadian living in a, a place, well, like Kingston, where I live, or a beautiful place like this, where you're in the a sort of a bowl in the mountains, you are really kind of insulated. This is not a criticism. Just saying that we are kind of insulated from a lot of the things that are happening in Europe. They didn't feel that because the refugees were trying to get into Europe. And that created a lot of conflicting feelings. Some people said we should welcome them. Everybody feels like if two or three million refugees come into Holland, a country with 15 million people, the effect could be kind of, yeah, I'm trying to think from the point of view of even conservative people who might think, no, that's too much. That could really be very hard on the country in all sorts of ways. Um, <clears throat> so I really lost my way. I, where, what was I? I was going to move it along. Oh, okay. No, I, I, I forget. I, I was answering a question, but then I went on a long digression. It was about whether or not people were paying attention and how yeah, yeah, yeah. people paid So attention. I want to say it, it, it makes sense that Canadians were not paying that much attention. We have crises of our own here, so. But I, I did think it was important that we pay a little more attention to that because I yeah. thought, think it's the, the greatest humanitarian crisis of our time. And by the way, it's still going on. Mm -hmm. 
people are still coming across every day to Greece and um, to Italy from, uh, from Africa. When I was introducing you, I didn't say that your books have been awarded for many national awards. Most recently, you won a Governor General's Award for Poetry, and this book was shortlisted for the Writers' Trust Award alongside uh, Lorna Crozier, who we had here speaking about her memoir. And how important is that kind of recognition for you, this book being nominated for a Writers' Trust Award? Uh, well, I, I, it's great. I mean, it, it's really good for the book. I mean, anybody who says, you know, they, they wrote a book and they don't care how many people read it is just lying. I mean, you want, it's an act of communication. You want people to read the book. And as I've said, I wanted people to know more about the crisis. And um, this is a kind of eyewitness account where I try to be a kind of foil or just a kind of I, E-Y-E, uh, -E, um, that, that's recording things uh, without being too self-referential. Um, <clears throat> so of course I wanted people to read it and uh, these days, more and more prize nominations are, are kind of essential to get people to read your book. It, it's sad. Uh, it wasn't this way when I started. First book came out in 1989. There was only one prize, really, at that point, and that was the Governor General's Award. <clears throat> so when there's only one prize, people pay attention, they read the winner. But it's a more democratic system. There's more room for other books to make their way by word of mouth. Now, um, thing, there's so many prizes, so many big prizes, and they kind of take up all the air. You know what I mean? Yeah. So if you don't get nominated for a prize, the book can really sink like a stone. And some people have a book coming out in the fall and all the award <laughs> shortlists are listed before their book is even out, so it's yeah. over before it's even it's, launched. Yeah, it's over before yeah. it even starts. Yeah. Um, in the book, you have a real dichotomy between writer versus volunteer, or inaction versus action, and you talk about being at your <clears> desk <throat> for all these years and in a way not being as active or engaged or helpful as you can maybe be on the shores in Greece. Um, and then when you're on the shores of Greece, you often, like, death is very front of your brain and you often feel forced to act when you feel not qualified to act. Oh, yeah. Um, I want you to just, first, like, I, describe, first of all, describe a refugee camp for us, for most of, for the people who haven't read the book yet and have no idea. And did you know what to expect when you went or was it all? No, I had no idea what to expect. And, you, you know, we, we all learn uh, from experience that your expectations are always wrong. You, you always have an expectation. What, what is it going to be like in Fernie? Well, I've been here before, but first time I go, I was envisaging a Banff, basically, right? And it's very different from Banff. Your expectations are always wrong. So I try not to have expectations, but of course I still did. So there were two main kinds of camp I saw. One was the big camp on Lesbos. It's called, it was called Moria. It's burned to the ground now. Uh, and it's, uh, it, it, some of you have probably heard about it, it was a, uh, a nightmare. When I was there, there were 3,000 people in an area of a few acres, um, 3,000 refugees, Af mainly Afghans and uh, Syrians. Um, but by the time it burned down last September, just over a year ago, um, there were 24,000 people there. Uh, by then it had expanded to about 25 acres, but 1,000 people per acre, they reckoned it was the most densely populated human settlement in the world. And that was, um, how to describe it, just lots of tents uh, crammed together and some facilities, you know, giving out um, water, uh, food, and uh, dry clothes and things like that. People constantly coming in and slowly leaving once they've been processed. Um, but I worked in a camp that was, in a way, a lot more interesting and certainly a lot more hospitable. <clears throat> it was a, an ad hoc sort of pop-up camp created by volunteers, uh, and that's where I worked most days. And it, it, it was called Oxy. It was named after uh, a nightclub. It was in the parking lot of a nightclub that had been closed because of, I think, for renovations. And the owner, you know, generously said, yes, you can have a refugee camp in my parking lot here. And um, a Syri half Syrian, half Spanish man named Omar, who's a real hero in my eyes, created this refugee camp. And it was a kind of way station for people who just arrived. We would give them dry clothes, warm food, water, and, um, and a, a place to sleep. Um, and then they would usually move on the next day. Uh, for most of the year, most of 2015, moving on to Camp Moria meant walking uh, almost 30 miles. And just consider this for a minute, most of those refugees, but 200,000 of them, uh, walked 30 miles. Most of them did it in one day. A lot of them did it with children. Their children walked, I and mean, they carried the kids some of the ways, but those people, most of them made it. Some of them got too tired and had to stop. 
uh, 200,000 people uh, ranging in age from, well, babies to, um, you know, I, I don't know how old the oldest folks were. They, they looked like they could be 80, 85, I couldn't tell. Um, but some of them were elderly and they did the walk too until they had a bus system. And there was not a single death. Um, that's partly because uh, volunteers and Greeks were giving out a lot of water along the way because it's, you know, 100 degrees, it's Greece in the summer. There would have been deaths, it was a lot of water, but uh, it's mostly a testament to their, um, <coughs> excuse me, stamina and determination. I mean, but think of that. I, have you ever, I've never walked 30 miles in my life. Um, and you were often, sometimes it felt like you were the only voice really concerned with various discomforts or like inhumane treatment of the crowds. Like, well, especially when they didn't have access to a bathroom. That would really bother you when people... Uh, when they it didn't wasn't just me. All the volunteers were upset about it. Yeah. Uh, it, it. And it wasn't... Even the Greek authorities, I mean, they were overwhelmed, right? I mean, there was one one case where they... <clears throat> I think they should have provided a washroom, but they wouldn't open it. And uh, Everybody's doing their best in an impossible situation. Mostly, yeah. Most people were doing their best in it. Were there times when you, how many times a day did you wish that you hadn't gone? Did you, was that? I don't think I ever, ever did. I, there was a brief um, kind of intermission, that's what I describe it as in the book. Uh, Turkey made a tentative deal with the EU to seal their shore so no more refugees could get across. And for about a week, almost no rafts arrived. So things were very quiet. And um, yeah, for that week, I thought, it's not, I, I felt kind of bored, but I also thought it's just not, I'm just not, it's not useful uh, in any way. I, should, I don't need to be here. And a lot of people left at that point. And then, of course, the floodgates opened again. And just when we had very few people left. Um, so that was a point when I thought I, I, I'm not being of any use here. You made a decision not to give everybody, anybody their real name. So use pseudonyms for everybody. Uh, not everybody, almost, almost everybody. everybody. One woman insisted I use her actual name. Who was that? Uh, Clara Romero. She was the oldest volunteer. She's now 77. She was 72, 71 then. Um, and she was an American woman. <clears throat> she said, no, no, use, use my real name because it's not my real name. <laughs> it's a pseudonym. She said I've been on, uh, on the run from the law for a long time. And, she said, <laughs> and also from some marriages and things like, she's, what a character. So she said, so use my real name. And then she told me what her real name was. She said, but don't, no, don't use my real name. Use my pseudonym, which is, yeah. Probably. Yeah, lots of characters in this book, but like, you would meet all kinds of people in a situation like this. Yeah, well, I mean, when you think about it, the people who choose to volunteer, are they're all going to be interesting in some way, right? Um, they're all kind of, it's kind of a self-selecting group of people. And there is a criticism at some point that they're partying too much, there's too much sex and drinking, and they're not serious. <laughs> yeah, uh, there's a, a German man who, I, I should have known, I'm kind of slow on the uptake, he's actually, he's on the autism spectrum, uh, he's a photographer, there are beautiful photographs in here by this man who called himself, uh, and I'm, I'm trying to remember what he actually called himself, what happens is when you use an invented name and you do draft after draft, that becomes a name, he called himself Neil McQueen. Uh, and I called him, oh, I can't, Jack, so, Jack Cassidy or something. It, it's a name that's basically based on his pseudonym. And, and he's German, so that was a pseudonym. But he was an extremely grumpy guy, and in a way I found extremely engaging. I mean, I had dinner with him once, if you can call it having dinner with him, and he was, um, and you couldn't make him laugh. He, he was impossible to charm. Uh, and he would just say, I think the, the volunteers are drinking too much, and it is a problem. And I said, well, you know, I think that a lot of them are just really stressed out, and this is how they're dealing with the PTSD or whatever. And he, he said, I, I did not, I, I can't remember how, he, it's, it's a sort of funny dialogue that I put in the... Um, he got mad at you for your analogies. At first you compared it to the end of exams, it's like students after exams. I said, he gets so, mad at you for that. Well, what I said was, uh, yeah, you know, okay, that's kind of not a very good analogy. You know, when you think about it, very few analogies are actually really good. And he said, it was a very bad analogy. <laughs> So he's one of those people who just refreshingly said, well, Germans are like that generally. They sort of say what they think. Right? But then but, he said, okay, it's more like a war. When you have an autistic uh, German, I mean, he's, like, he's so direct. I mean, it was, it, it was wonderful, actually, once you got used to it. And then you said, oh, it's sort of like a war, and you, you referred to some of his pictures that were very warlike, and he didn't like that either. No, he didn't like it. I said that some of your photos looked like they were taken in a war zone, and 
And he said, this is another weak analogy or something like that. <laughs> anyway, great guy. And he agreed to let me use the photographs. He, and I insisted that he read the passages where I described him in our conversation, because I thought he might be unhappy with it. And he was a little grumpy about it. He said, I get it, I get it. I am the grumpy man. I am always the grumpy man. My friends tell me to. Uh, he said, but I have one objection. You shouldn't have said this. Uh, it will get me in trouble with some people I've been supporting there, uh, a certain group, a uh, quite radical group of, um, of uh, Syrian volunteers. And I agreed and I changed something to sort of keep them out of trouble. Were you disillusioned with any of the humanitarian efforts or bureaucracy when you were there? Do you feel like you're- Yes. Yeah. So then that's, is that why you changed the name? Because of criticism there? Is that what made you change the names or you would have changed the names anyways? Well, I, I, I don't, uh, I think I only gave first names of people uh, who were with the large um, uh, NGOs. And I found a lot of them really officious. Uh, something kind of terrible happens to most human beings when they put on a uniform, even if it's just a kind of logo bib saying UNHCR. They become uh, officious. They, they take, um, they take on them, uh, they take into themselves some of the, uh, they assimilate to themselves some of the power that accrues to a large and extremely wealthy organization. Uh, and that makes them kind of lord it over people. And one example I give is uh, I was in the restaurant with Neil McQueen, uh, eating and being, you know, being berated by him for my weak analogies. And a group of NGO people came in and um, they were so loud and they came in and they sat down at a table and they proceeded to dine and drink a lot of wine and eat. And there's nothing wrong with that. All the volunteers are doing that too. But there was something, uh, there was a kind of space occupying territorial energy. They were very loud and when they laughed, you know there's a way people laugh when they feel superior. Uh, like throwing their heads back uh, so you could see the backs of their throats as they laughed. It was that kind of laughter like we are power, and I just thought, you, you people have no sense of where you are right now. Show some respect by just being a little quieter. I'm not saying you shouldn't drink wine. I drank wine every night. I love wine. Uh, and a lot of the volunteers got drunk, as I said, for, I think, for fairly good reasons. Uh, so they were free to get drunk, too, because I think some of them were pretty stressed out as well. But be a little quieter. Uh, you know, I mean, don't laugh quite so loud. Because we're in the middle of a war zone, basically. Yeah. yeah. Did you learn anything new about yourself on this um, experience? Uh, yeah, probably. And if it's a memoir, I should have put that in, but I, can't, I, don't, I don't know if I did. Um, I just, I, I outward, learned... Sorry, it's more of an outward-looking memoir than an inward-looking It is. Memoir. I was trying not to, but there's a moment near the end. I, I, I realized that I'm a, you know, even more emotionally repressed than I thought. What happened was right uh, when I was leaving to catch the bus to leave the island, um, an old uh, Greek woman signaled to me, I was in a little store, the, the streets are only about from here to the stack there, and they're that narrow. She was in her doorway calling to me saying, come over, I need your help, and I was paying for some groceries, um, or just a little food for the, for the flight, and I sort of went across, and she said in Greek, you have to help me, my husband is, um, needs your help. And she led me into this sort of catacomb-like house. I mean, it was just a bungalow, but it seemed there were all these alleys. And she, he was, well, to, to make a long story, well, it's not a long story, but to make it even shorter, her husband, who looked to me like he was in his mid-90s, I think, um, and dying, he, like he was very close to death, had collapsed. And he, he was just in a, in a diaper, basically. And she needed me to pick him up and get him to, his, to their bed, their bed. And, um, one moment. Anyway, uh, I, I managed to get him up, you know, sort of hammer lock under the armpits and get him to the bed and get him down to the bed. And he, um, he, you know, he said thank you and um, sat there looking like very, like within hours of death. And she thanked me in a, in, in a way that was wonderfully brisk. Um, she just, she, she, she said, Tahirisu, uh, your hands, put your hands out. And then she sprayed my hands with this uh, s solution, and then she led me to the door, and uh, she said, uh, uh, you know, a uh, and then, you know, goodbye. And, and, uh, so, and there was no sort of goodbye embrace or thank you, you're such a kind person. So the wonderful thing about it is she thought this was very ordinary. When you need help, you ask another human being for help, and they help you. 
And um, yeah, it was it was it was really beautiful because of that because she wasn't you know. But as I walked away, I just um, I kind of just collapsed and I just started crying and everything. I think because uh, I just was thinking about my mother and, and various things uh, and just you know like things in my own lifetimes I hadn't been like her, you know, that loving and uh, it's, it's it, I, can't, I think I explain it much better in, in, a, in, in a much shorter way in the book, but I sort of uh, fell apart and um, I just thought, you know, I, I've been holding a lot of stuff inside. Um, but I kept that moment's a very short moment in the book and I didn't want to make, you know, a lot of memoirs are just about the author and it was really important in this case that it not be. So that was one of the few moments. Um, I think you described it very well. I just very got very teary there because I thought just the simplicity of asking for help and expecting someone to give you help. Yeah, and see, that's what the whole the whole thing, uh, the whole book is about. What human beings need to do: help each other in moments like that. So, in a way, that moment isn't really about me. It's it's just about realizing that there shouldn't be anything unusual about just offering this kind of help, but we're too busy to do it. So, anyway, it was very moving. Can you read a little bit? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll try. I mean, because I, I could have to hold the microphone in the book. I think that's, that should work. That's why you have two hands. Yeah, but how am I going to turn the page? Oh, well, I'll figure okay. that out. No reason to panic yet. Okay, <laughs> so I'm going to read a uh, short passage. Um, and let me just set it up for you. Um, okay. Page 50. So this is the second, my second night um, on Lesbos, second or third night, uh, second night working with an organization called Starfish Foundation, it's a volunteer organization uh, that I went and, you know, I, I was helping them within an hour of joining up. That's how desperate they were for help. And uh, all the volunteers, as you'll see in this scene, ended up doing things they are not equipped or trained to do. Um, and this is a perfect example. So this is the second night. Um, things had quieted down after uh, like a really busy time at the men's clothing tent. We were giving out clothes, dry clothes, to a long line of Syrian refugees who'd arrived. And things had quieted down. It was close to 11 o'clock. And we figured that was it, because boats don't try to cross once it's really late. But one, uh, a couple boats did, in this case. Um, a couple names you'll hear, uh, Omeros is my name for Omar, who was the Syrian Spanish guy who ran the camp. Um, and uh, the other names I think will be self-explanatory. I follow Omeros behind the clothing tents where another bus has just arrived and we intercept a party descending toward us. Asim, Asim was our only Arabic translator. Um, we needed more and he was the only one. Asim, a squat bearded bus driver, and a heavy woman sprawled back in a wheelchair, her scarved head lolling. Asim and the driver are struggling to restrain the wheelchair on this grade. As we meet them, I realize the woman is unconscious. What is wrong with her? Omiros asks, raising his voice over the wind. We don't know, Asim says. She disembarked from the raft, but then on the bus. What is disembark? Omiros asks. I must return, the driver says in Greek. Others are waiting. I'll go back, help Lindsay, Asim mumbles. I'll stay here once we bring up the rest, Iraqis. His lips barely move like a ventriloquist's. They say he has hardly slept in weeks. Omeros and I take the wheelchair, one handle each. We too struggle to restrain it, and then the slope leveling out to push and steer it over the gravel. Finally, we shove in through the door flaps of the military field tent that serves as medical clinic. A single light bulb dangling by a cord sways over a table. A few unoccupied cots. A portable radiator searing to the touch. The Médecins Sans Frontières nurse must be off helping somebody who has collapsed or grown hypothermic. Omeros and I consider trying to lift the bulky woman off the wheelchair onto a cot, but decide it would be too difficult and risky. We leave her slumped in the chair, which we park and break beside the radiator in the corner farthest from the door flaps. Wait with her, he says. Check her signals. Her vital signs, I ask. Her heart, her thermature. I'm no paramedic, I say. I will find the nurse, Stavro. Until the nurse comes, you are the nurse. Stavro is what he, is the Greek for Steve, that's what he called me. He ducks and rushes out through the door flaps. I glance around. Under the table, a stack of folded gray wool blankets. 
I kneel and grab one, shake it open, drape it over the woman, up to her fleshy chin above the scarved part of her brown hijab. Her head is tipped back but remains stable, presumably supported by her sturdy neck. She is motionless, unresponsive. The victim is unresponsive. Mentally, I hear the phrase. I hear dispatchers radioing the phrase on TV medical dramas. I know the phrase means, as often as not, dead. Her waxen lips are parted, but when I lean close, I hear no breathing. I see no rise and fall of her bosom under the wool blanket. Something leaps to mind. A young undertaker at a bar in Detroit telling me that our eyes, not used to seeing unbreathing chests, will always project slight motion into the chests of the dead. I do the math, get a double negative. If she were dead, I would see movement. I see none. She must be alive. Her round, plump face is unwrinkled, though she must be in her fifties, maybe older. Expression not pained or stricken, but serene, as if she is at home in her own bed, in dreamless sleep, somewhere back in Iraq before the wars. I hold my fingertips close to her lips. Is that a faint feathering of breath? I cut my hand over the pale band of brow, well, easily done, showing under the edge of her hijab. No fever, no obvious chill. Could she be hypothermic and not chilled at the brow? I doubt it, but I'm not sure. I feel for her hand fumbling under the edge of the blanket. This, of course, seems even more of a trespass than touching her face. I glance at the tent flaps, hoping to see the nurse push through, yet fearing I'll look like some pervert. And what if her family arrives? Where is her family? Some people, I've heard, feel titillated and licensed when left alone with an unconscious, helpless stranger. I feel scared shitless. I find her hand soft but solid, larger than my own, and warm. Now I'm certain she can't be hypothermic. Hypothermic bodies siphon blood from the extremities to the core. Don't they? I lift her hand clear of the blanket and feel for the radial pulse under her sleeve. Her wrist is thick. I have to pinch hard. Still holding her hand, I crouch down beside the wheelchair. I locate the pulse, half surprised to find it where I knew it should be. It seems steady, neither too heavy nor too faint. I check my watch. Hard to make out numbers in this light. 21 beats in 15 seconds? Still no response, but her signs seem okay. There's nothing more for me to do except stay with her until the nurse returns, so I take up her hand again and simply hold it. It's all right, I tell her. Nurse will be here soon. You'll be all right. I assume that she can't hear me in her stupor and won't understand me if she can. I try to recall other moments in my life when I was thrust into a role of serious responsibility for which I felt unequipped. Maybe waking 20 years ago in a bed beside a wife and a four-hour-old daughter, the midwives gone home, the two of us improbably entrusted with this new life. Over the next month, I and the other volunteers will repeatedly wake to find ourselves entirely unqualified, but forced to act. Uh, such a powerful scene. I remember it vividly from reading the book, but it's even more powerful when you read it aloud. Um, excellent. So you talked about, you went on this experience between drafts of your novel about refugees. What that you learned there made it back into your novel? Uh, I, always call the, no, I always want to call the novel The yep. Nightingale Won't Let Me Sleep. But it's actually <laughs> called The Nightingale Won't Let You Sleep. So it just says that damn nightingale won't let anybody sleep. But, but what made it back into the Nightingale book? Hardly anything, really. You know, uh, the book was uh, substantially written when I, when I left. Um, I mean, the, it's the rewriting that takes me forever, and that's increasingly it's like the law of diminishing returns kick in, and I can't quite stop. I have to keep going and trying to get it perfect, which is I know it's, it's a pathology, um, but that's just the way I write. So substantially, it didn't really change, and I didn't really add. I don't. I don't. I may have added a few small details about refugee conditions, but the conditions under which my fictional refugees were living were so different. Um, they're living in a deserted city, which by the way is now being reopened on Cyprus, it's called Verosha. And um, 
they're in houses that they've basically re abandoned houses that they've refurbished. So they they actually are living quite comfortably. So it was very different, and I wasn't a really able to add anything or didn't need to. Surprises me. So that means that you had it more or less right in the first place. The emotional heft of it that you didn't learn anything new at the emotional level that you kind of had to weave back in. You had it. Um, well, I did, but I think I was learning it about very different people under very different circumstances. Mm -hmm. So it, it just it didn't applied. fit with my refugees. They right. they were people who'd been in the same place. They weren't really refugees. They were people who had right. founded a little village, and that that's quite different. They had been refugees at one point. They all fled to this place. Yeah. So they were no longer in flight. So yeah, it was, it was kind of silly of me really to think that there might have been any sort of crossover. You, and I think all of your books, all of your books that I can think of, that because I've read several of them more than once, you have a real preoccupation with ego and almost a Buddhist sensibility. I don't know if you'd call yourself a Buddhist, but I think you know a lot about Buddhism and you have that sensibility where you're always trying to um, you know, reject the pull of the ego or doing things yeah. for ego reasons. And how does that factor into this experience, the role of the ego and how you, what you have to resist or be aware of? Yeah, I, I wouldn't, um, <clears throat> I wish I could call myself a Buddhist, but I haven't done the work. I mean, I don't meditate every day and I think that's an important part of the practice. Certainly, I, I try to I subscribe to Buddhist principles, which of course I fail to observe and live, but, but yeah, aspirationally, yes, aspirationally I'm a Buddhist. and. Um, and a Christian, aspirationally, like, I mean, like, Christian, not like, what, you, not a Yaoist, like, actually what Christ taught, and that's the same that, as what Buddha taught, the Buddha taught. Um, so, about ego, well, I, I, like, I, 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 for whatever reason, and I'm not going to blame my parents, that would be ridiculous, I grew up with this need to, like, achieve things, to, to sort of validate my, my existence, ratify my existence, and sort of, uh, excuse myself for taking up space on earth. So uh, that involves a lot of ego. You you need a lot of ego energy to finish a project and then to go on the road and read from it and talk to people. Uh, and and to a certain, well, okay, maybe I, for a long time I was saying, you know, ego bad, ego bad, selflessness good. But in fact, um, you know, Ginger and I have talked about this, that you have to distinguish between persona and ego. Um, you really need a persona, like an interface between you and the world to protect yourself, advocate for yourself, uh, and you need, and behind that persona you have to have a, a strong ego. But what you don't want to have is, is an ego that's trying to impose itself on other people and feel that it's important, um, and, and then it acquires that sense that somehow it can be immortal, that if it becomes important enough it will actually survive, like survive when we know uh, we're not going to. Um, so ego is actually a good thing as long as it's just it's just in the form of a, a persona that that sort of advocates for you and um, yeah. I want to shift gears, but I hope everyone, if if you haven't read this book yet, I hope you do because it's very well worth the time um, for the experience and the lessons and the writing as beautiful as all of, all of Stephen's writing. But I want to shift. Recently, House of Anansi has bring, brought out a selected works of uh, the last his career. Can you hold it up? as a poet, so he, I think poetry is your form you enjoy the most, is that true? Uh, no, not lately. Well, uh, singing or songwriting, which is a kind of poetry. It is, it's, it's uh, poetry by other means. These days I want to write stories and songs. Huh. Uh, and that is the form the poetry is taking. How does it, it make you feel to have a selected work, so oh, an old? <laughs> okay, can you, I don't know if you can see it, it says Stephen Hyden selected poems, 1983, 2020. It looks exactly <laughs> like a headstone. We went, we went by a cemetery, it's a cemetery as we drove here. And I was thinking how this book looks like a headstone, right? There's there are the dates. So, um, yeah, there's something kind of valedictory and uh, epitaphic about it, right? And so it's it's a, there's a little, a little yeah, ominous. Yeah, you are it. tremendously successful as a poet. You've won the major poetry award in the country, and it's a huge honor to have someone. No, it's an honor. Yeah. Holmes, House of Anansi, possibly the best poetry publishing house yeah. in the country. But yeah, it makes you feel old. It does. It makes you feel old. Yeah, and it also makes you wonder. Am I going to write another poem? Because there, it's not like 1983 hyphen. It's 1983 2020. It's over, right? So, and I really, I've hardly written a poem in a year now. All the energy, as I said, has gone into writing songs, which are poems. But um, can you read us a poem or two? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, maybe I'll start with. Uh, oh, yeah. What kind of poem? What kind of poems do you want? And I think Patty, you have this one. Do you have some of this book? I don't have that one. I'm 
You have the novel and the memoir? Awesome. Okay, uh, this is one, I, I was thinking of doing it tomorrow night uh, during the, uh, the, uh, Music. the set at the distillery uh, because it's, a lot of my poems for a long time aspired to the condition of music. It's as if I was always going to uh, write songs. And this is a poem from uh, about 20 years ago um, that is so much, so much aspiring to the condition of song that it's actually called Grave Song. Um, it's said that the dead want us worthy of something. Why will you wait till the waiting fills years? Pain shoveled deep leaves no chance. Sorry, pain shoveled deep has no chance to bloom open. A grave, a stringless guitar, a lost song. Enough, they must hate to see us here sleeping. Why will you stall till the stalling's your life? It's wake yourself now or never be woken. Lifetimes you waited for the right phone to ring. The drowned, it was said, could be heard at night singing. Why do you never set out while you can? It's fix yourself now or always be broken. A grave, a stringless guitar, a lost song. That's so powerful, what a call to action. I feel like I need to go do something important, except for I am doing something important. Yeah, well, a call to action, but yeah, did I take my own advice? So nobody ever takes their own good advice, right? So <clears throat> here I'm still quoting the poem, still thinking, yeah, time to, time to get around to that. You have that advice in the memoir too. You said um, something will Very happen much. to everyone that wakes you uh, from your slumber, <clears throat> and what are you going to do to that call? What are you going to do when you get woken from your slumber? Yeah, this, the final paragraphs where I sort of reflect, I'm trying to reflect on, trying to turn the personal into the political, um, thinking about you know the microcosmic and the macrocosmic, that we don't, nobody changes until they absolutely have to. Like we all think about changing, and then finally there's some, big crisis in your life and then finally you change you know now you care enough to change and I was thinking uh, you know partly about myself but also about um, you know our world um, I mean, we we all know that there's there are a lot of problems out there the humanitarian crisis there climate crisis all sorts of things and we do want to change but I, it feels like we're gonna wait until there's absolutely no choice and often then yep. it's too late so it's it's scary right very scary thank you for being so generous in your conversation and your reading and uh, your beautiful poetry oh thanks i want to give people other people a chance because i could ask questions for six more hours but i'll give does anyone else want to ask a question before we wrap up we have time You had to find your own your own place. Um, oh, you know what? Sorry, we should repeat for the live stream. Oh, so the right. question was a logistical question, and when he was on Lesbos, where did they house the volunteers? Uh, volunteers had to find their own places, and uh, the places were very cheap. I mean, my room cost ten bucks a night, uh, so it was three hundred dollars for the whole time I was on Lesbos, the whole month. Uh, and there were cheaper places. I couldn't get into the cheaper places. Some of the young volunteers. There were a lot of gap year kids who were there, and they generally uh, room together uh, like in a sort of hostel and they were paying like a few dollars a night so um, people had to pay for themselves but it was it was very cheap tell the story am i remembering this right about the aggressive housekeeper you had in your apartment oh she was delightfully aggressive she was she was she was greek she was a a, 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 a greek woman of a certain age and they did just get very fussy about their house and so she would wait till i left the room in the morning like she'd find out what time are you working tomorrow and so she'd know and then I'd often hear her sweeping outside the door, waiting for me to leave. You know, like it, like when I, she'd know, okay, he has to leave right now. She'd be sweeping, and then I'd, I'd go out, and and then she'd say goodbye, and I'd lock the door, and I'd leave, and then I'd come back, and I'd always find signs that she'd go. Well, she she went went in to clean up, but she would move stuff around in a strange way. Like I had some, I bought some cookies or something, and she put them in the fridge, but then she took the ouzo out of the freezer and put it on the counter. So she'd move stuff around, and uh, where she thought it should be. Yeah. Place. Yeah, and she'd also say, like, she'd take things, uh, she'd put some, oh, no, she, uh, I can't remember, there's a, there's a funny story in there, but I, I sort of caught her by using a, a, a clothes peg. She, she closed one thing with a clothes peg, 
and I changed the clothes bag to a yellow one, and she changed it back to a green clothes bag. Um, so, and she, like, I'd fold the blankets, she would refold them, and, and uh, she'd also remove all, I had tons and tons of, like, Greece is very cold in the winter, Lesbos is very cold, and there's no heat. So I had, like, about nine layers of blankets, and, and um, you know, and I'd, I'd make the bed carefully in the morning and look really neat, and I'd come back and she'd remove all the blankets and fold them. It's like she thought it was somehow unmanly for uh, this guy of Greek heritage to need all these blankets, and it's not Spartan and stuff. So she, but I, I love that. I love that kind of uh, human theater, especially when like she, we'd pass each other and not she wouldn't let on a sign that she was going in there and moving stuff around in a really weird way. The mayor came tonight, so you know it's a big deal when the mayor shows up. Well, he's my former teacher. The, your former I, teacher is now the mayor. I knew I recognized and, you. And well, my classmate is behind Gordon. Here. Gordon has a oh. question. Uh, well, well, no, I guess, I, now that I'm speaking, one of the things that I find really fascinating with my current line of work is I, I work with a, a provincial organization right now, and there's a real refugee advocate that I work with, this brilliant woman um, in, in Vancouver, Trish Mendewell. And one of the things that she brought to our attention a couple weeks ago was how can Canada receive more refugees successfully? And one of the calls to action that she's asking us to support, so I don't know what it's like from, for you, maybe you're from a, from a major center, but having refugee support structures in place in rural Canada where housing is more equitable and more mm. affordable. So, so we, we're seeing major failure rates of, of, of supporting refugees in Vancouver because you're never going to get into a cycle of, of home ownership or yeah. rental ship. So, so I don't know what your next steps are, but through your lived experience in credibility as an author, as Andy said, ethically, you know, we need more voices to talk about how Canada can support and receive people because there's so many amazing parts of rural Canada that are just mm -hmm. underserved to receive refugees. And also some small cities, like ones near Kingston, where it's still fairly inexpensive to live. Uh, I, I was thinking maybe you'd run into some problems with refugees who want to go to centers where there are already a lot of Syrian people. But yeah, you know, on the whole, I, I, I don't think so. I think it's a good idea. Yeah. Are you pursuing that with in the, yeah, this I area? Yeah, and then maybe, maybe I'll join you in conversation about that. Okay, great. Gordon. Not that many, uh, maybe three times in my whole life. Okay. Yeah. But do you have a relationship? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, as I listened to you, I became very curious about this was a very particular kind of visit. Did it change your thoughts about Greece and Greece? I'm just going to repeat the question for the online people, is that uh, Stephen obviously has a long uh, connection to Greece. Uh, Greek is his mother's mother tongue, so he knows some Greek, his mother's it was her mother tongue, mother's mother's tongue. Um, and he went back there, and he's been there many times, and did this trip change his relationship with Greece? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Not, not many times, only three, three times, uh, I think. Yeah, first time when I was five years old with my parents. Anyway, um, did it change my relationship with Greece? Well, I was uh, filled with respect for the Greeks when I was there. Lesbos, okay, so it was the Greek economic debacle in 2008, so Greece has been in a depression since 2008. Um, moreover, on Lesvos, which had weathered out the depression because the olive oil industry is so strong there, uh, Lesvos also had tourism, and the tourism had been destroyed by the refugee crisis because all the refugees were coming through, and of course tourists don't want to go, and it's a, you know, the epicenter of a refugee crisis. Um, and yet, most of the Greeks I met were extremely supportive of the refugees, they were understanding, um, and they were even helping. A lot of people were helping out, you know, on a volunteer level. Uh, I gather that that changed in uh, the two or three years after I was there in a way that I suppose is understandable because the economy was completely destroyed, everyone was out of work, and some people started, um, initially only right-wingers were hostile to the refugees. Some people who had been supportive became a lot less supportive, and I think their attitude was, you know, why us year after year? 
but on the whole, I was I was really impressed. Uh, the Greeks have a tradition of um, uh, philoxenia. Uh, is that the word? No, philotimo. Philotimo is a sense of honor in how you deal with other people, and then philoxenia, which means love of the outsider, uh, philos and uh, xenia. xenia. Um, so philoxenia is, means that you are like morally obliged to to be hospitable to people who come from a long way away, and you know a lot of countries have principles like this, and they don't always observe them, but the Greeks seem to be doing it, and that really, I wouldn't say it fills me with pride, because I'm not Greek, I'm Canadian. Uh, I can't even speak Greek properly. Um, but, uh, so I, I will say I was impressed by the Greeks, that they were helping so much and not being hostile in the way that some other European countries have been. Not, not the Germans and the Dutch and the Swedes, they've been quite supportive, um, but there's some other Eastern European countries that have been quite hostile too. Okay, I think we'll, oh, Anne has another question. Well, I just made an observation. I think that, um, the young we talked about a little bit earlier tonight, but we always try to make magic with a shoestring budget. So for those of you that weren't in the writer's conference with Gordon and I, the location that we had Stephen at was up in the ski hill in the, the, the cafeteria uh, that um, has the black the gate with jail. So partitioning the room off from, you know, where the daycare is. Um, no catering, or uh, we only bring a water bottle, and it was, I don't even know if you've heard of Enoch Court, but it was like off season. Yeah. It was the least glamorous place you could have been at Writers' Conference. It was fantastic. It was fantastic. Yeah. And it's just so nice to see uh, your trajectory, so thank you. Well, thank and 11 you. years ago that was. Yeah. Time flies. Oh, oh Lucretia has a... Thank you for Hi. having me back. I really appreciate it. So, I'm going to repeat that for the camera. So uh, Lucretia asked about his movement to songwriting and how his writing of um, prose and poetry and nonfiction relates to his writing of songs now. Um, well, I, I wasn't really, I probably made it sound as if I've sort of like, um, you know, matriculated from one form to another. But in fact, I, I, I wrote all, all these different forms um, like collaterally right from the beginning, poetry, short stories, not novels, but poetry and short stories and songs. I wrote some songs uh, when I was a teenager, I wanted to be a songwriter. That's what I thought I would do. Uh, and then I just got, then I spent 30 years trying to learn how to write poems and stories and novels. Um, but basically I stopped writing songs for a long time. Then I came back to it uh, in the, over the last few years. So it was something that I always uh, did to a certain extent. And do you find it very similar to writing poetry? Oh yeah, sorry, that's the essence of the question. Do I find it similar? Um, no. In fact, you'd think that because I'm a poet, I would write words, poems, and then write music for it. But that's not how it works for me. I almost always find a tune, a tune that, uh, a riff or a tune that suggests lyrics. And sometimes it takes a long time to figure out what those lyrics are. That's usually how it works. Uh, a few times I've had lyrics and a tune come in a dream, like I've woken up. And because I can't write music, I don't know how to do tablature, I just have to write uh, like sort of things showing where the notes are, because I know I'm gonna fall back to sleep. And will I remember the tune in the morning? So I write the words and like something showing where the tune is going. And in the morning, so far I've been lucky three times now, I've remembered in the morning. And then two of them have turned into songs that are on the album actually. Didn't you have a song that you had written part of like 20 years ago or more? And yeah, you just the, kind of figured out the ending of it? Now? There are two songs on the album. Uh, one was written more or less completely uh, in 1991 in Banff, and another was started in Banff and finished uh, in Kingston uh, while we were working on the record. And how does, that, how does that happen that you have an idea and a thought and it's a song and then it's concluded so much later? It doesn't change the whole. Yeah, that song, well. It's really simple. That song was written 30 years ago about a relationship um, that uh, was kind of on again, off again. And um, when it finally ended, that kind of provided the ending of the song, basically. Yeah. It's a great album if you haven't had a chance to listen. And also, uh, the distillery tomorrow, Ginger is going to sing with him, and Ginger has the most beautiful singing voice I've ever heard. Wow. Um, wow, indeed. 
Thank you all so much, and thank you to the library, and thank you to Patty and Patty, and Stephen will hang around and be happy to answer your questions in person, and you can get a book signed, and they make signed books make fantastic Christmas presents, and um, we will see you in February with David Robertson. Thank you so much for coming.